Bueno, buenos, buenos días a todas y todos. Eh, gracias por estar aquí. Eh, gracias también al profesor. Lo voy a presentar en castellano, luego él la, la ponencia la hará en inglés. Tenéis un pequeño resumen de los puntos a tratar en, en la mesa de fuera, por si, por si es de, os, os es de ayuda para ver por, por dónde vamos. En la puerta, en la, exacto, en la, en la mesa de fuera lo tenemos. Eh, voy a presentar muy brevemente al ponente y luego ya le daré paso porque es el protagonista de, de hoy y, y presenta un tema muy interesante con el cual creo que todos tratamos y, y además genera bastante discusión en la actualidad, como es el populismo. Berjan eh, Ferbeck es eh, catedrático, eh, trabaja en el ámbito de la teoría y la ciencia política, es director del departamento en una universidad de nombre complejo en, para los que hablamos español, que es Routeboat University en Nijmegen, que es, nosotros lo traducimos como Nivega aquí en España, una, una universidad muy puntera en, en los Países Bajos, que trabaja en temas de, de teoría y ciencia política con, con un departamento muy potente y multidisciplinar. Él es el director de ese departamento y tiene una investigación bastante plural, porque trabaja temas que van desde las organizaciones internacionales, eh, la política exterior, pero también tiene toda una línea de investigación en los últimos años vinculado a la conferencia de hoy, que es el, el populismo. Y sobre eso no, nos, nos va a centrar la charla de, de la sesión de hoy, que es la segunda del ciclo de conferencias, concretamente respecto a los mitos o posibles mitos en torno al concepto de populismo y el significado de este término. Eh, la idea también es que no solo haga la conferencia, sino que también podamos discutir con él. Si alguien se siente incómodo preguntar en inglés, podemos traducirlo entre nosotros, puedo intentar hacerlo yo. Eh, así que, por favor, que nadie se quede con, con ganas de preguntar algo. Si, si quiere hacerlo en inglés directamente perfecto, si quiere hacerlo en castellano, lo traducimos desde aquí. ¿vale? Y nada, os dejo ya con Berjan. Muchas gracias por estar aquí hoy en la, en la Jaume I. Gracias. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for your kind words. I think I understood the gist, but not the details. Uh, I know Radboud is a very difficult name to pronounce in any language, even in Dutch, possibly. Um, thank you so much for having invited me to give a talk on um, a topic that has been uh, on, the, um, on the agenda of uh, my colleague and, and mine for quite a while. My colleague is uh, Andrei Zaslov. This is him. I have to have him here because I cannot do it without him. Um, and as I think Ramon correctly introduced me, as I'm sort of at the, uh, the borderline of international relations and comparative politics. And indeed, it's the combination of those two uh, sub-disciplines in political science that brought Andre and me together in writing about uh, populism and more particularly about populism in Italy and the Netherlands. Uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to share my thoughts, uh, our thoughts with you. Uh, and I hope that this is, um, this is Actually, the second kind of exchange between uh, your university and mine, and I hope it will be uh, the second in a, in a long road to come. Um, having said that, uh, Nijmegen is here. <laughs> so this is the Netherlands. You will see this map actually quite a few times today. Uh, so we're, well, it's basically the German border, although no one is living here, <laughs> but it's the German border. Belgium, Germany, and we claim to be in the center, of course, of the country, but to be honest, we're not. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, anything can be reached within one, two hours, so it's never that difficult to move anywhere. Um, I think it was. I did not. It's okay, right? But you cannot hear me. Should I, put, should I sit down anyway? Is this better? I should not do that. Okay. In the middle? Oh. Well, they have my political. Thing is, is this better? Okay. Okay. Sorry. No, 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 it's okay. You should be able to understand me. Okay, uh, I will talk in English indeed, um, but uh, do not hesitate to, um, to slow me down if I talk too fast, to interrupt me if I am not clear in what I'm saying, to uh, object to what I'm saying if you feel that uh, I'm, saying, I'm saying nonsense, just challenge me on this. That's part of the game uh, in, in presenting myths, I would say. And um, uh, yeah, and afterwards there's also time to, uh, because Ramon, you will translate any kind of questions, I guess, that there might be in Spanish and so forth. Okay, what I would like to talk about, uh, and some of you may have seen it in the summary already uh, that was distributed in Spanish, 
I want to talk about two things. One is a more general statement about what you might call myths of populism or what I sort of watered down today in contested issues surrounding populism. But the idea of myth is still important because I think what we are uh, heading for rather soon in our scientific study of the populism phenomenon is that we sort of uh, may fall prey to, to the idea that anything can be or is populism nowadays in, let's say, Western democratic systems, and that it be therefore becomes increasingly difficult to pin down what we exactly mean by populism and to uh, formulate uh, research questions, scientific research questions around it. Because if anything is populism, well, where then do we draw the line? How do we formulate our research questions? I will return to that and we'll try to make that point by discussing at least four of the nine myths that in total uh, we distinguish in the paper that you're also welcome to have a copy of, but which are summarized on the, on the one page thing where we find the, the nine contested issues or myths, four of which I will discuss more in detail today because Ramon, I'm not sure what he asked or suggested or that I sort of imposed on him <laughs> the idea that I would also talk about politics in the Netherlands uh, to give you an idea also of what's uh, happening in my country, um, what has happened in the past and is happening today. Um, so I will try to apply uh, at least four of these notions of contested issues, myths of populism, to the idea, the history, the politics of the Netherlands. So you have that we kill two birds with one stone and you know more about myths and you will know more about the Netherlands and you already know what Nijmegen is so I mean I, I'm a winner today already because that's uh, already an accomplishment. Okay, um, basically then let's start first with the, the popularity of the study of populism. This is both true for what's going on in the public debate and in academic debates. You may know about the famous letter initiated by French philosopher Bernard-Henri Lévy uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, signed by 30 intellectuals, authors, art artists. A letter published first Libération, then uh, uh, copied everywhere in the Western world, calling for a European resistance to populism. And this already sort of indicates that another initial problem, that on the one hand we talk about populism in public debate, and we do that on purpose and we want to accomplish certain political objectives in doing so, saving Europe in this case. On the other hand, we want to talk about populism in a scientific way, understand what is it, what we mean by the phenomenon, how to study it and what is relevant and what is not. And these things are not always easy to at least separate uh, analytically and maybe even to, uh, to keep distinct uh, all the time. Because we are, most of us are both a scientist on the one hand and a, a citizen, maybe even a political activist on the other hand. So that is difficult. In, uh, in science, we can see the popularity of uh, uh, populism in, the, uh, in this uh, graph, which is also on your handout. The graph suggests that, it's, that it also takes into account uh, Spanish language publications. <laughs> That's not the case. It's about English language publications that we can trace in Google Scholar. Uh, based on keen words populism and populist and we observe here that yes there is a surge in scientific attention to the populist phenomenon particularly taking off uh, around 2009 of course we have to sort of take into account that before anything gets published I mean there may have lapsed about four years since your research and then submitting it somewhere and getting it published and seeing it in print at some point so basically what we observe here is a discussion of what has happened maybe already here. But nevertheless, we do see uh, that more and more scientists are um, interested in uh, describing, explaining uh, populism. Possibly, because what of course, which period is here? What, would you, what kind of societal events would you connect to, to these matters? What major events took place between 2000 to 2010 for you? Crisis. Economic financial crisis, potentially 2001. 9-11, oh war on terror, at least, uh, and, and the, in general, the intensification of globalization, if you want to. Um, indeed, the, that may be one of the, uh, the things we may discuss later 
uh, whether uh, the rise of uh, populism, and hence also the interest in populist studies, uh, is related to these kind of societal developments. Um, what do you know? Yeah, I gave it away. <laughs> what do you know about the Netherlands? Uh, why are we so interested in the Netherlands in populism? Um, I look at you, I don't know why. I assume in my country, students always take the seats furthest away from the teacher, so I assume you're students. Is that correct? <laughs> I don't know. You are? Okay, so uh, what do you know about the Netherlands? <laughs> do you know this man? I was hoping that would be the only man you know. <laughs> but if you, you don't know. He's our maybe most famous populist. Anyone? The man with the peroxide hair. The man who has been living under protection for 15 years now because his life has been threatened and he lives undercover, protected by four tough men, never sees daylight, only if he goes to parliament. This is the main, uh, as we say, populist leader, Geert Wilders is his name, and he's the leader of the PVV, the Party for Freedom. Uh, at this moment, most people would claim the, the biggest uh, populist party in the Netherlands and has been a, let's say, a phenomenon, if you want, in Dutch politics since uh, 2005, 2006. There's a new kid on the block in the Netherlands. It's this man, and you can already tell he's younger. He doesn't have to paint his hair. Um, his name is Thierry Baudet. Sounds French, but he isn't. Uh, and he's the leader of a new populist party. It's called Forum for Democracy, in itself a very interesting name. Um, and he's at this moment rising in the polls. I'll get back to the polls later on. And some people see him as the main competitor of uh, Wilders, but we will see that actually he is adding to Wilders uh, and has been enlarging the populist share uh, in, at least in public opinion polls, uh, in, in, in Dutch votes. Um, so she, what, what then do you know about the Netherlands? If you think of Holland, what do you think of? <laughs> I need to know because I have to talk a little bit about Dutch politics on, so I need to know what you do know, what you don't know. Are we a monarchy or are we a republic? <laughs> monarchy, yeah. Does the, does the king have power? No, hardly. Any, okay. Um, are we a federal state or a unitary state? Interesting question, no, for this country here. <laughs> well, we are a unitary state, although we decentralize a lot. Not officially, we tend to give tasks to the, the, the municipalities and the provinces without giving them money. That's our type of uh, decentralization. But there is no formal uh, federal state. Although there is a kind of separate layer of power, if you want, which rules the water in our country, because you must know that we fight the sea all the time. You do? You don't? We do. Uh, we, we build our history, our career on kicking out the sea of our uh, low countries. And that means that ever since the Middle Ages, we have this administration of water and dikes and mills and, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, to regulate that. And that is a separate political layer that is, it's not federalism, but it's, it is different. And we vote for them. Actually, in two weeks' time, there will be a vote for the administration of these water works, so to speak. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of democracy on its own. We have one region that is a little bit different. It's in the north. They have a separate language and they have a separate literature, and they can talk their language officially in court, but there is no real, let's say, separatism, if you want, in, in, in my country, at least. Okay, so the unitary state. I'll get back to it. Uh, I will quiz you at the end, okay? We'll see. I don't have, well, uh, no, I don't have a prize here. No. Okay, let's go back to the main argument. One of, one of the nine myths or uh, contested issue I want to put forward is the idea that Populism is a new phenomenon, and new is, you could partly see that in the, in the graph, because apparently ever since the early 2000s, people get interested in this. So is it a thing that got there only, let's say, with the war on terror, or the increase in globalization, and or the financial economic crisis of the, of the late 2000s? Um, it is what you would believe, and I think if you look at the public debate, because so many people are worried about what populism is and what it is doing to democracy, et cetera, et cetera, that it seems a new phenomenon. Maybe it's best uh, illustrated by 
well, these are not all populist per se, Orban clearly is, um, but I think it's very much related to our tendency nowadays to, to sort of think of what we apparently see is a rise of strongmen, of sort of quasi semi authoritarian leaders that use parties to mobilize support from themselves and then go on to change the political system to their benefit one way or another or for their personal gain if you want. I think in the public debate we see a tendency sort of not to look too much to populism per se as a phenomenon but to somehow identify it with these strong men, authoritarian leaders that people also desire, some people would even claim. That is how in, in I would say in international public opinion we, we lots of talk about it. But if you really look at populism as a phenomenon, what it is, how that's the other myth we're going to talk about, but it has been there for, 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 for decades, if not centuries. I mean, the American Populist Party uh, has been very active at the end of the 19th century, in the early 20th century. In Latin America, we have uh, elements, uh, examples of populism that we might uh, relate to Peron already after the Second World War and later. Um, if we look at French French, French Pujadism in the 1950s that some people claim was a, a precursor of, of uh, populism or even a true populist movement. That took place much earlier and even the tradition in Scandinavia in Nordic countries for anti-tax parties, particularly in Denmark and Norway, uh, predates our current uh, wave of populism and have been active political parties ever since the early uh, 1970s. So, it's not correct, I would say, to say that populism is new, but it begs the question exactly like, first of all, do these waves, if you want, of populism differ, or do we see a similar uh, uh, phenomenon that we can observe? And it, it must make us pose the question like, why do we see um, it in some countries rather than others, in some moments rather than others, and how, if you want, then to explain the let's say, the seemingly surge in populist parties, movements, uh, leaders, ever since the early 2000s. And I'm not yet sure whether we have reached that uh, level of knowledge that we can already answer that question. Now, if I were to apply that to the Netherlands, so is populism new to the Netherlands? Um, I would say no, we had some precursors, although not that, that many, I must admit. But here is some of Dutch politics for you. Um, four important elements, I would say. First of all, that ever since the end of the First World War, the Netherlands as a society was characterized as a so-called consociational democracy. It's a word I never, I, I, it took me decades to learn to pronounce it. Consoci there I go. Consociational democracy, which basically meant that there were four segments of society, let's call them socialist, kind of liberal, Protestant and Catholic, where groups of people were living basically in, in, in groups of like-minded people. And their lives would be pursued just with that like-minded people. They would read a socialist newspaper, would go to a socialist sports association, would uh, go to a job where somehow a particularly socialist would be working, they would be the member of a socialist trade union, they would vote for a socialist party, etc. So they would have social security through socialist voluntary associations, etc. And this would be true for all these four, well, three out of four, but um, uh, what we call pillars in society. That's why we call it societal pillarization. Importantly, because you might think that these four groups would fight each other, they did not. The elites on the top level would on the one hand stimulate some kind of conflict between the groups in order to mobilize them and gain political power, but then once the elections were over, the elites would cooperate together and would, it's a famous thing for the Netherlands, at least we are proud of it, we would try to reach consensus, meaning that we would keep on talking forever until some kind of consensus would be reached among the elites of these four groups. And therefore, policies were, um, could be implemented with a lot of popular support. Um, now, you might say, that is very nice. Maybe that was nice. But it meant, particularly, uh, well, also before, actually, but certainly after the Second World War, that all Dutch cabinets, all governments, were dominated by Christian democratic parties. First, we had three of them, depending on how you count. And later, they merged into one, the 
the CDA, the most important uh, Christian democratic uh, party in the Netherlands at this moment. And that meant that the Christian Democrats basically had coalitions either with the liberals or they would alternate that with coalitions with the social democrats. But always the Christian Democrats would be at the center of power in the Netherlands. You might already get a glimpse of what populism might look like, that is being dissatisfied with mainstream parties, being dissatisfied with the elite governing the country for a long time. The first, let's say, um, um, attack change in the system came in the 60s with, well, basically partly due to the media uh, that made people open to information from all kinds of other societies, due to economic growth, individualism and so forth, people started uh, leaving their pillar, as we call it, they would not be so loyal to the social group they, they usually spent their whole lives in. And importantly, therefore, they also started somehow considering maybe to vote for new or other parties. There was a possibility, certainly, for new parties to enter the system. The most important one at that moment being the Democrats, 1966. The, it's 66 referring to the year when they were founded. That actually wanted to get rid of the domination in the Dutch system of, uh, the, of the Christian Democrats, but also the, the alternation between social democrats and liberals in the, in the government. They wanted a completely new system with elements of direct democracy, with actually, at that time, they wanted to abolish the monarchy um, and reshape Dutch society in many different ways. Um, that sounds pretty populist to some, although no one would actually classify them, I think, as a populist party, not even in those days. Now, the true populist of those days might, was this man. He has never been that powerful, but at the height of uh, his popularity, he had about uh, eight, nine percent of the vote. Uh, farmer Kukuk, <laughs> as, as you would proudly say, the representative of the Farmers' Party that was some, had some kind of popularity in the 60s and the 70s, in which one of the elements of populism, a distinction between the elite and the, pu the, the corrupt elite and the pure people, if you want, We'll get back to that later, uh, was already uh, put forward. The idea that farmers are usually portrayed as stupid in my country, but actually they're very smart. And it's the city folks, the elite city folks, that are the real stupid guys. That, that's the game he played. And on one way, that was a kind of a, a strategy, if you want to, to, to become popular. But it was also a representation of an, a resentment that we prefer not to think of that much because we when we look back upon the history of European integration, it's all Hosanna. But actually, in those days, when in European integration, the common agricultural policy was the only successful policy area of the EEC at that moment, not everyone was profiting from the uh, common agricultural policies, particularly certain types of farmers that uh, actually were impoverished in the Netherlands because of those agreements, because they fell out of the premiums that some got. The dairy producers were okay, the others not. And he sort of mobilized that disgruntlement against Europe already in, in those early days. Um, that's not that much of a precursor of, of populism in the Netherlands, but it gives you a fair idea of how things started changing in the 1960s, 70s, which is to, remind, to, uh, to keep in mind when we get to the the real big days of Dutch populism uh, around 2000. It also helps already uh, building my argument that I think one of the most neglected elements in populist studies, and I'm exaggerating a bit, but <laughs> that's what I have to do, right? Um, is that I think that many researchers have neglected the possibility that the classical, um, is that a famous name here or not? Steen Rockham, Stein Rockham? Oh, um, does the term political cleavages mean anything to you? Yeah, yeah okay. So Stein Rockan is one of the classic theoreticians of the 60s, actually, uh, of uh, the most important political cleavages at that day. And he, said, he argued that center periphery uh, was one of the, um, across political systems, one of the potential important social cleavages around which a political cleavage could develop. Um, 
in my country, we never really believed in center periphery cleavage just because we're such a small country and everything is in one hour distance or so. I would argue that in my country, center periphery does matter and has mattered in mobilizing uh, populist support. Um, importantly, um, therefore, if, when we talk about is populism new to the Netherlands, so there were some movements going on. The most important thing in the 1990s is that actually electoral volatility uh, really increased in my country. You may imagine that what, when you were still part of a societal group that just lived among each other, you were a Protestant, you were a Catholic, a socialist or a liberal, that meant that there was not much electoral volatility. You had your party to vote for. Maybe in the 60s you opted for, if you were of a new generation and you wanted to uh, to rebel against your parents, you would vote for the Democrats 66. But importantly, this is 1992, uh, this is 2013, um, particularly since the end of the Cold War, I would argue, we see an enormous increase in uh, electoral volatility, measured as this 39.1% indicates that 39.1% of the voters had voted for a different party than they had previously. Yeah? And what we observe in the Netherlands there is that after the Cold War, um, okay, volatility was never really much more than, well, roughly under 10, really jumped up and people were prepared simply to switch sides and not just going to, let's say, a party which is somehow like the party you always fought for, like, uh, as a social democrat, you might opt for the socialist party the way around. Now people would move across the political divide and the socialist might vote for a liberal party or, um, or even for a Christian democratic party, etc. So we see suddenly that voters are on the run, basically. Now, this brings me to another point, which is the, um, the ninth uh, myth uh, here. El populismo es estrictamente un fenómeno doméstico. Uh, um, that is that we, I think, we underestimate in our study of populism the impact of international politics on domestic politics in general, and particularly also the rise of populism. It's the end of the Cold War that basically puts domestic politics in disarray. The left has no real message any longer. Everyone wants to be a Democrat. The Christian Democrats could no longer point to this danger of communism as the main reason to vote for them, etc. There is an ideological vacuum caused by international politics that at least not directly puts forward people voting for populists, but it opens up the possibility for electoral volatility, for no longer being concerned about, yeah, this used to be my party because I wanted the Russians to keep out of Europe or whatever, or the other way around. You could just choose whatever you wanted. The ideological distances did no longer matter that much after the Cold War. And probably, particularly the Social Democrats still have lots of problems in answering uh, that uh, ideological vacuum as do the Christian Democrats actually in my country. Um, and that sort of opened a, if you want, it, it laid a foundation for, it opened um, a window of opportunity for what later would be populist uh, parties. In the Netherlands, though, I would argue that it was not like a, a Big Bang uh, event because of 9-11 or any other big issue, European uh, surge in European integration or so. It slowly built up, and we, we, we political scientists, we, we refused to see it. It built up because, okay, um, there was a rise in what we call elderly parties. I'm not sure whether that's a correct translation. I don't know how to say that. Maybe you know, how do you call them here? Senior, senior party? No. Senior. Oh, well. um, when the Christian Democrats started in 1994, when they still thought they would, as they said themselves, we rule this country. That's what they literally said then. Sorry? Classical parties, you mean? No, I mean the... Um, for all the people. For all the people who, who, who fight for the interest of pensionados and so mm -hmm. forth. Yeah? Okay. They announced that they would sort of reduce uh, pensions. And that they announced it about two weeks before the elections. And in two weeks' time, a new party was built out of nothing. Uh, 
for the pensionados, so to speak, and they took away actually such so many votes from the Christian Democrats in 94 that the Christian Democrats lost their possibility to basically decide what kind of coalition they were going to rule in. And they would not be ruling a coalition because 1994 would mark the first year in which social democrats and liberals would come together to have a very unlikely coalition, maybe, ideologically speaking, yet in a coalition to kick out for the first time, as they saw it themselves, and were proud of it, the Christian Democratic Party. At the same time, we saw an incredible increase in the growth of so-called local parties. Maybe I can show it here. Um, never mind the, the Dutch words. Here you see the total number of Dutch municipalities in 2006, 10, 14. I should have presented uh, uh, data from before. I, they, will, they will be there later on. It argues here, it tells you, the numbers tell you in how many municipalities a certain party is the large, takes the largest share of the vote. These are all regular parties, and these are local parties. And you see that they were already pretty big in 2006, and they move on to be actually put together the biggest party uh, in the Netherlands. Something that political scientists refuse to, because we political scientists in the Netherlands municipalities, that's really boring, we're not going to study that. But here you could actually already see what was changing in Dutch society. I think I have, oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, this is, this is 94. Uh, this, is the, this is in the 90s. What is uh, these are all municipalities in the Netherlands. What is yellow is where local parties are the biggest party. Again, talking about center periphery, what is the center in the Netherlands, would you say? <laughs> no, it's not Utrecht. Oh, it's part of it, though. What is the real political, cultural, economic center of the Netherlands? It's this area. Amsterdam, The Hague, Rotterdam. Utrecht, maybe. This is the, uh, the major financial, economic, cultural, political hub of the Netherlands. And you see, well, these local parties... They are part of the south, the part of the east. Let's hear still what the socialist stronghold was keeping up at that time, but that would not last very long. Um, I have to go back, I think. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting. Um, the local parties would then, towards the end of the 1990s, unite in what was called the Leefbaar, the livable movement, which was a mixture of local mobilizing people, locally in, in, in towns, in, 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 um, uh, you call it, in specific uh, districts, in towns, and the catchy word, the slogan would be livable. We want this country to be livable. That could mean many things. And indeed, it was a, a rallying thing for many types of ideological... Uh, <laughs> persons, if you want, but it was about the environment, it was about crime, all particularly local issues that people felt that mainstream parties at the municipal level, at the regional level, at the national level, were not really uh, responsive uh, towards their citizens. That livable movement threatened, if you want, threatened from the mainstream party's point of view to become a national party around 2000. And that is when Yes, livable, livable Netherlands, livable Utrecht, livable Almere, livable Rotterdam, it's everywhere livable, livable, livable. And that's where we meet the, maybe the, f the most important um, catalyst, probably, of populism in the Netherlands, which is not 9-11, but it involves violence. It's the political murder of the leader of, well, let's for the moment call it the livable movement, Tim Fortuyn, uh, I'll go, get back to him later on, uh, who uh, was murdered just uh, two days, three days before the elections in 2002. Uh, the first political murder in the Netherlands since, we claim at least, 1672. What happened then is for a different meeting. That's an interesting story too, but because it involves Spain as well. But um, that doesn't matter. Okay, so at this moment I made the point, I hope, is populism new? No, it is not new. Is populism new to the Netherlands? No, we have some precursors in the 60s, 70s. Maybe, they didn't matter that much. 
But the, the newness in the Netherlands is not related to a sudden outburst in the early 2000s. It is related to the big changes in the 1990s due to the end of the Cold War, due to electoral volatility that followed partly from it, and the, the lack of, let's say, ideological content of mainstream parties, coupled with discontent of Dutch citizens at particularly the local level, the local level that was traditionally ignored, not just by political scientists, but also by the mainstream parties. Okay, second contested issue or myth. Can we agree on what populism means? And some people would say that it is not possible to reach agreement on what it is. You might argue, although few do, that populism is almost identical to political opportunism, 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 whatever. You know what I mean. Um, I don't know if we mean that opportunism means that you that that as a, politi polit as a politician you cater to your voters and you sort of do what they want you to do, you might also call it responsiveness. Um, I think, yeah, you could make the argument if you want to, but it, it doesn't help us, because every politician to a greater or lesser degree is an opportunist. Uh, but still, most politicians are in the end also uh, phrasing their, their strategy in some kind of ide coherent ideological frame, more or less coherent ideological frame, that basically constrains their actions. They cannot just jump from one extreme position to the other. That takes a really ideological U-turn to justify such a move. So I, I, I would rather not take opportunism as the defining element of, of populism. Although, let's say, giving the people what they want might be an attractive associational idea of what populism may or may not mean. Might populism be a political strategy uh, some people claim that, and we're back to the strongmen, maybe, the leaders, that populist leaders display a certain type of style. They, um, uh, they like to talk about in-groups and out-groups. They like to, um, uh, to make use of the media in a particular way. They like to, uh, to insult colleagues and so forth. Um, they like to look for scapegoats, etc. Many people claim that, well, populism is particularly a certain style of conducting politics. Yeah, I cannot deny that there is some truth that populist politicians engage in these type of, of activities. At the same time, it does not help us, I think, distinguishing, let's say, populist leaders, parties from mainstream leaders and parties, but also, because also regular politicians engage in the same type of strategies, sometimes because they feel uh, the competition of populist parties, etc. So I'm not sure whether that brings us the, 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 the real line of demarcation there. Um, here's an exa um, yeah. Some people say populism is it's anti. You're anti-mainstream, you're anti-establishment, anti-incumbent. Yes, it is true that to a large extent, populist parties uh, um, fight incumbents, fight mainstream parties. But don't all oppositional parties sort of fight incumbents, not just the uh, populist parties? Um, and to be honest, I don't think that there are that many populist parties that actually really present themselves as anti-establishment in the sense that they reject officially the democratic system in which they are participating. It's true that some political parties put forward, particularly when they gain uh, a seat in government, um, uh, all kinds of um, policies that sort of jeopardize the idea of liberal democracy, of the pluralism that we think is inherent to democracy. But I'm not sure whether that many, maybe Fidesz in Hungary comes very close to it, but. I think most political parties still operate and pretend to operate and continue to operate within the parameters of what we call our parliamentary democracy. So I'm not sure whether they are that much anti-establishment. And some people say, these are mm, people who base themselves on Laclau and uh, Mouffe, who would say that, well, populism is rather a 
a discourse. It's not a party, it's not a person, it's, 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 it's the discourse is what we're interested in and they, they may all involve the things that we just discussed, uh, that I presented on how you deal with outgroups, how you see your own group, the, um, um, uh, in the, the wordings you may use when you engage in, in political debate. But it's a discourse, and the discourse might then be everywhere. All kinds of parties may adopt it to a greater or lesser degree, and in adopting it, we may reinforce it, or we may change it, and so forth. Yes, I, that, that is, I think, a distinct alternative that we might consider. Uh, but I think it's very difficult to, um, uh, to come up with a, a clear, coherent research program, I would say, if we adopt that one. I think if we were going that direction, what we really would need is a, a much more thorough analysis of the, the relationship between, let's say, the people <laughs> and the populists, and let's say the, what constitutes the, um, the common ideas uh, among the people that politicians draw from, play on, exacerbate, uh, try to lead. I'm not sure. I'm personally uh, much more in favor of the definition uh, uh, number five, which focuses on uh, uh, populism as first and for all a, an, an ideology, and not just an ideology, it's what has been called a thin ideology. This is, has been put forward by people like Kas um uh, one of the most, maybe the most important author nowadays on, on populism. Um, And the reason why I'm in favor of it is that it, I think it helps us at least carve out a, a phenomenon that we can use to compare phenomena across time and across political systems, and a phenomenon that allows us therefore to, um, uh, to do proper comparative research uh, uh, about. We'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your views on that. What does thin-centered ideology mean? It means most and for all that the pure people are juxtaposed with the so-called corrupt or bad elites. That constitutes the basis of any uh, populist movement and or party. And it's important to realize that these are still open concepts. I mean, what the pure people is or are, that, that, that could mean many things. For a, a nativist, radical right, political populist party, it might be the national group or the ethnic group uh, that he or she considers to be the, uh, the basis uh, of, of society. If you are a left-wing populist, it might well be that the pure people consist of anyone in this world beyond borders uh, that is one way or another um, uh, at a disadvantage because of the way the international, the world political economy is, is working. Similarly, the corrupt elite can mean many things. The elite could be the national elites uh, of the mainstream parties. The elites could be European elites. It could be transnational elites like uh, CEOs or uh, people working for IMF and World Bank. Although they all have as a constitutional idea pure people versus corrupt elite, these things may differ, the conception. And of course, when the conception differs, the proposed uh, strategies <laughs> differ and the proposed policies differ. It implies that, uh, sorry, in this theory the implication is that having just a notion about people versus elite is not enough. That doesn't help you presenting, you a, uh, presenting a political platform. It doesn't help you win votes just being like that. You need to borrow from another ideology to have a better, better story to go to the polls. That is, that there's always a borrowing or a thick ideology. So you could borrow from socialism, you could borrow from liberalism, you could borrow from nationalism, you could borrow maybe even from Christian democracy, I'm not sure about that, but in principle there are all kinds of combinations possible, which is why populism is not exclusively right-wing, even though certainly at the beginning of populist studies, when I was a big focus on uh, the radical right, uh, it seemed to be uh, presented that way. But populism can be of any, if you want, ideological um, streak. How about the Netherlands, then, if we talk about it in that way? Um, let's talk first with the thin-centered 
ideology. I think in the Netherlands we have at least, or have had, three types of populist parties. We had the radical right wing populism. The man, the, the young man with the beard and the cell phone uh, in Forum for Democracy, the new one, he is the most outspoken radical right wing uh, populist we now have, I would say, and he borrows from nationalism uh, particularly. Wilder's Party for Freedom is usually cast as a, a radical right wing uh, populist party. That is true, I would say, in terms of his anti migration position and his anti EU position. But in his social economic policies, he displays a strange mix of left wing and right wing, uh, even more left wing, I would say, uh, policies. Um, so I, I, I find him uh, very difficult to classify. There has been a liberal populist party, that was the party of the murdered man I talked about, Pim Fortuyn. This means List Pim Fortuyn, um, who combined some kind of anti-migration, anti-integration discourses with an open, open economy, a very uh, market liberal uh, perspective on, on the economy. Liberal populism, like Forza Italia in uh, Italy would display on the Berlusconi, or um, 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 Fujimori in, in Peru did, or John Howard uh, in Australia. And then in the Netherlands, we would have a left-wing populist party, the Socialist Party, to be distinguished from the Social Democratic Party, uh, although the Socialists never like to be labeled populist. <laughs> um, I think most uh, academic, experts now, ex academic experts now would cast the SP as, um, as a populist left-wing party. Which leaves us with many other parties that we find very difficult to classify. Um, the elderly parties, the pensionado parties, we're not sure about them. And we have a party for the animals, um, strongly growing uh, um, a party, which one way or another has a very strange idea maybe of the pure people, the animals, <laughs> and the corrupt elite, all of us who treat animals badly. But it's difficult. But these are the most important ones. In terms of strategy, it can only be denied that uh, mainstream parties have taken over very often the discourse and sometimes the policy positions, uh, some of the policy positions of uh, populist parties. Most uh, best exemplified in 2017 uh, after the Dutch parliamentary elections when our Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, said the good populism has won and the bad populism has lost. And with good populism he meant himself. Mark Rutte is a liberal from the Liberal Party VVD. And that's already interesting to, to note such a thing that, um, first of all, uh, political scientists noticed that the mainstream parties moved, particularly in migration policies, to the position of the right-wing populist parties in the uh, running up to the uh, to the elections, and secondly, that in the public discourse now suddenly we will be talking about good populism and bad populism, and that brings already another important issue um, uh, um, um, uh, at the table. I would say that is that populism nowadays is increasingly a a concept that is difficult to use without let's say, political connotations. You can use it to, uh, this is the point of Ramon, actually, this, this is not my point, it's Ramon's point, uh, over coffee this morning, that you can use it to discard someone as a populist, therefore making him or her less credible, uh, if you want, uh, as a serious political player. So, in that sense, populism is becoming an increasingly uh, difficult word here. Okay, no questions yet? Am I still clear? I'm, yeah, okay, okay, good. Um, third misconception, how are we doing in time? Sorry? Good. Good, okay. Um, populism is a danger, and that of course is um, a thing we may also discuss and share that, that notion to a certain extent. Of course, the 30 intellectuals clearly see European populism as a danger to the future of everything that Europe stands for in their view, uh, liberal democracy, rule of law, um, and anywhere in, in, in let's say, the, the big public opinion making magazines and websites and so forth, there are warnings against uh, populism. And maybe rightly so. Uh, we clearly observe that where populists uh, gain a lot of strength, 
that they seem to uh, curb the freedom of association. That's what's happening in Hungary under Orban, why uh, the Open University is withdrawing uh, soon to, to Vienna. Uh, that they try to curb the position of the, um, uh, of the judges, like one tried to do in Poland. Um, that they um, maybe even have a tendency to, to move towards more authoritarian style of leadership. Maybe if we haven't, we haven't used the Trump word yet, but if Trump is a populist, I'm not fully sure yet, clearly so that America is moving towards a, a system where he tries to bypass regular uh, procedures of uh, democracy, for instance, by using the emergency laws. So it is not strange that from that perspective, everything that we, thi what we think we share uh, in terms of the, the principles of liberal democracy, that they may be in danger once so, uh, populists are gaining strength. Now I talked about populists in power, but we also know that, that mainstream parties do display a tendency to imitate some of the policies uh, of populist parties in order to, to stay in power themselves. So they may also have an effect not just by being in power, but simply growing either in the polls or uh, actually at, the, um, at moments of uh, parliamentary elections. Okay, granted that is a serious issue, we should also nevertheless open up ourselves to the possibility that under certain circumstances, populism may be, may be having positive effects on our democracy. First of all, it can shake up party systems that have been dominated by the same party for a long time. Um, Italy is a famous uh, example in point that has been dominated by the Christian Democrats uh, since 1946 um, and was shaken up, well, uh, first uh, again 1994 the immediate aftermath of the Cold War, such an important moment uh, for many uh, European countries at least, um, with the advent of the first Berlusconi government, which itself was partly building on the success of the, uh, the Northern League, the Lega Nord, that had been slowly building its success in the 19, late 1980s in regional elections, local elections in the north of Italy, uh, responding to the disgruntledness of people who felt that they uh, were, uh, on the one hand, uh, very productive in making a, a good living and good money for the Italian economy, yet felt um, bereft of their profit by, uh, by the central government, Christian Democratic-led government in, um, uh, in Rome. This, of course, in Italy um, took much more uh, prominence uh, after 2000 with uh, three further Berlusconi governments, and now again with the coalition uh, between uh, the Five Star Movement and the Lega. The point being, however, is that my colleague Andre and I would argue that no matter how bad you look upon Italian populists, what they did manage to do, though, one maybe not on purpose, but it was the effect, is that they created a credible, legitimate center right for the very first time in the Italian political system, where until, let's say, the mid-1990s, it would be impossible to take a sort of right, center-right political position, because you would be discarded as a kind of illegitimate political figure in the first place. Um, so in a certain way, also helped by the way the Italians designed the electoral system, there is now the possibility to choose between at least two, maybe three, uh, major political families in the Italian political system. So you can, with your vote, you can actually contribute to alternation. One of those elements in, in democratic theory that are mentioned, but that we maybe do not take at heart that often, or as often as I would like at least. It's part of Dahl's concept of polyarchy, uh, contestation, the likelihood that a sitting government can and will be replaced because of uh, elections. Secondly, Populism can give voice to those who are not represented. Italy comes to mind here too. Uh, the Five Star Movement in particular, I think, succeeded in mobilizing voters that would otherwise not have been mobilized. The young, particularly, and those who felt that they were betrayed, in their words, by the center-left, uh, the PD, 
um, and yet did not feel, let's say, right-wing enough uh, to vote for either uh, uh, the Lega or Forza Italia. And that is a, a quality I think we should not easily underestimate. And in a way, populism can improve political responsiveness of mainstream parties. We may not like it, <laughs> we may disagree with the specific policies that they are putting forward, uh, but in a way, populist parties force mainstream parties to listen to uh, what people uh, want. Um, how's that in the Netherlands? Oh, oh, sorry, I should have presented. Okay, this is, of course, I'm not sure whether you read his book. Uh, he, he's one of the big public uh, people in the public domain now putting this forward. Um, oh yeah. Well, here are the heroes, and if you want, of... Uh, creating alternatives for the Italians. Uh, Berlusconi with his uh, Lega companion, uh, Umberto Bossi, and now Di Maio and Salvini. How about the Netherlands then? Well, as you can see, the populists are not really liked by all. <laughs> I'm not sure what your uh, cigarette packages look, at, look like nowadays, but this is what, <coughs> well, it's even worse in the Netherlands now. You see terrible diseases now on the package. So it says, okay, Wilders is an extremist, he harms both you and society. And this is a very bad um, poster, I would say, of Pim Fortuyn, the murdered man uh, I talked about. Um, um, the savior, it says here, uh, but of course he is depicted as a, uh, as a fascist. Uh, LN stands for Livable Netherlands, the movement he, he was to Epitom uh, is that a word? He, he was about to lead. Um, so it is um, extremely, uh, it's seen as extremely dangerous by many people. And as you know, uh, or you may not know, um, the, uh, the Dutch, Dutch judges have various times uh, trialed, uh, trial, is that a word? Yeah. put on trial Geert Wilders for discrimination. Uh, um, Possibly, potentially even racism. There's not a verdict yet in this latest case. Uh, so people also mobilize to um, not just politically, but also uh, in a legal way to try to, to, to beat uh, uh, populist movements. Could we still say that they did something positive for the Netherlands? I still think they did. Um, they shook up the Dutch party system. Um, the electoral volatility of the 1990s, the end of Christian democratic ruling, the dissatisfaction with the mainstream parties produced an incredible further fragmentation of the Dutch political system. At this moment, we have 13 parties in parliament. Our parliament consists of 150 seats. So it's extremely difficult to, um, uh, to form a, a government in, in my country. The biggest party doesn't even have 30% of the vote, much less. Um, so, fragmentation is uh, a main product. Uh, it shook up the system, but you could say, well, that's a good thing, because the Dutch political system has been dominated by three parties, and particularly the Christian Democratic Party, ever since the Second World War, and if you take a very bleak view, uh, ever since the First World War. So, there's more to choose from, uh, what uh, one might say. Nevertheless, it has produced some uh, relative political instability. We had seven governments since 2002, which for Dutch standards, an average of two years, is actually uh, very unstable. Um, second, populism can give voice to those who are not represented. Um, I think that is what populism in the Netherlands did. And by appealing to instruments of direct democracy, whether you like it or not, they forced the, the elite, let me use that word, to at least note <laughs> what was uh, going on among the, among the population. Um, this is the, uh, the vote um, uh, surrounding the, the referendum on the European Constitutional Treaty in 2005, I think. Um, uh, forget 17, that's a different, that's a different uh, slide. It's this one. Um, so you see that almost everywhere in the Netherlands, uh, again, these are municipalities, people voted against the European Constitutional Treaty. Now you might say, well, who cares? Uh, because this was not a binding referendum. 
we don't have such a thing as a binding referendum. Yet, the government had said, well, we'll take the vote seriously. They did not take the vote seriously because they did not campaign wholeheartedly in favor of the treaty. They uh, really re neglected the issue and uh, offered the opportunity to an, an, a, a wide range of movements and parties to rally against the European Constitutional Treaty, in which the Populist Party, particularly the, the Party for Freedom, played a very important role and partly built its, uh, its success and, la and therefore later prestige at exactly on this uh, campaign. Point, of course, being that the Dutch government had always taken a very elitist uh, view on how to deal with Europe and not consulting the people uh, in the broader sense, only catering to certain vested interests, um, and was actually really confronted with a major defeat that they certainly had not expected. Another one occurred about 10 years later when there was a, an EU association treaty with Ukraine that actually had already been included, but the Netherlands population, the Dutch population, uh, collected uh, a sufficient number of uh, signatures to ask for, a, again, a non-binding referendum, which was held, and the majority of the Dutch voted against this treaty, even though it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to go back to the negotiation table and, um, uh, and try to negotiate a different treaty with Ukraine. The major people involved in this were, interestingly, a what you call not a populist party, although they joined the bandwagon. It was a populist movement surrounding a, an internet movement so, uh, around a, a website called Geen Style, No Style, uh, uh, which is a, a, a very critical of the mainstream parties, made a, a big point. Uh, about this treaty as Europe selling us out to uh, those Slavs over there, whatever the, the, um, uh, um, um, the slogans were. Jan Roos is his name, uh, he, uh, and he was very successful in uh, getting, that, uh, getting a no vote in that referendum, but again with no real consequence because we, we the Dutch government, could not really change the treaty. And there have been similar disgruntledness about uh, uh, mobilizing against TTIP, uh, mobilizing against um, uh, centers to um, accommodate refugees after the, uh, in the Syrian crisis. Um, it says, as it says, such a center, no, weg ermee, get them out. Um, and again, here, of course, here you see the center periphery. Uh, uh, distinction um, uh, re returning because, of course, where would the Dutch government position the refugee centers in this country? They would go in the periphery, not in the center. Uh, and they mobilized particularly people who felt that they, not that they, I would say, yeah, maybe some of them were honestly, honestly against migrants and, and refugees, but a fair large amount of people would say, well, I'm here not because I'm against the refugees, I'm here because they're getting from our government things that my daughter, my son has to wait for for 10 years. It's this relative deprivation, if you want, particularly in the periphery, that was the, uh, the ferment of, of that type of uh, um, uh, protest. And the latest uh, problem, uh, if you want, <laughs> encountered by the government was the, um, that's more of a left-wing populist uh, issue, but also taken on by right-wing populists, uh, the idea that the Dutch government is basically uh, catering to Dutch multinationals, giving them all kinds of tax breaks paid for by the Dutch taxpayer, uh, making Prime Minister Rutte the, um, the instrument of Royal Dutch Shell and Unilever. Uh, all indicating, uh, I would say, that um, populism give, give, can give voice to those who are not represented. And maybe it improves political responsiveness, at least the Dutch government nowadays in the European Union is very tough against Italy, as it has been against Greece, in uh, basically, as the populist saying would be, preventing that they spend our money. Uh, as you see, Castello Festa Italia, that's how we perceive our Italian uh, uh, fellow citizens. Fourth, 
um, uh, myth or uh, thing, and that's related, of course, to the idea of populism being in danger, and that is that essentially populism, populist parties, are unfit to govern. I think it's best illustrated if you take um, uh, some of the covers of the, uh, the weekly The Economist talking about the Berlusconi governments. Um, the basic message is populists, particularly Berlusconi, should not be ruling because your country goes down the drain or, as phrased, the man who screwed an entire country. Um, where does that come from? I mean, first of all, in practice, this is from the paper, uh, if you look at what is happening in Europe, particularly ever since the 2000s, maybe before that, we see that populist parties are part of the government one way or another quite frequently, and that is true for many countries here, at least there are already uh, eight or nine of them um, where that is the case. And that might be true both for radical right populists, liberal populists, left-wing populists. I hesitate classifying those, we can talk about that later. The point being that, okay, they may be unfit to govern, but they do govern. And particularly in Denmark, uh, that is not necessarily seen as a, uh, a thing that went too badly, although the Danes are very strict on migration, um, nevertheless. It's part of a discourse. Populists are unfit to govern, and that takes two forms. One is to sort of, uh, as an instrument, to keep them out, to use that in political um, discourse, in, in political debates, to warn voters not to vote for populists because you wouldn't want them in the government. In Dutch, we would use the word, they're not acting responsibly. That's the, the magic word in the Dutch language, to discard someone as uh, unfit to government. Um, and secondly, sometimes you would co-opt them in the government strategically just to, to demonstrate that they're not capable. So you, people would actually use that to demonstrate the, uh, incap inca what's the word? In incapability of populist parties to govern. That is certainly what happened in the Netherlands where we have two instances of um, uh, populist parties in government. The first one occurred right after the murder, I talked about it, of Pim Fortuyn. This is his funeral. Uh, so this is very unusual for the Netherlands. I mean, this type of public showing for someone dying is, well, maybe it happens for a soccer player. Maybe it happens for a really famous singer. But it, it, it's really seldom, and certainly not for a politician. And this man, Pim Fortuyn, um, one way or another, struck an enormous chord with many Dutch people. Partly because he, um, he was a very flamboyant, un-Dutch type of person, in a way. Uh, partly, of course, because uh, he got killed for, well, for what reason? We don't know. He was killed by, by an environmental... Uh, extremist actually who wanted to protest against his idea of uh, allowing the, uh, the, 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 the meat industry to, I don't know, to have more pigs per square meter than we had in the past. I think that was the, the reason the, ma the man quoted for, for, for murdering for time. The point was that it happened in between uh, municipal elections in March in 2002, where unexpectedly Fortuyn in Rotterdam became the biggest party and his movement, the livable movement, uh, seemed to flourish everywhere in the country. And the uh, parliamentary elections in May in 2000, 2002. And that's a very interesting period uh, for Dutch politics because you see how the mainstream parties just do not know how to handle this new man. Some tried even to kick him out of the, of the party and then because he thought, well, he has some kind of uh, uh, authoritarian uh, tendencies. Let's kick him out of the Leif Bar movement, livable movement. And he founded a new party for himself. Again, within the course of one month, he mobilized uh, half the country, so to speak, behind this new party. Then got, got murdered two days before the elections producing a, uh, a huge entry of his party uh, in the Dutch parliament. They were the second largest party. 
uh, and somehow politicians felt they had to deal with it and co-opt it in the government. But they did so in order to get rid of it as soon as possible. And that government left, uh, sorry, that government lasted for only five or six months, was characterized by co reluctant coalition partners who didn't want to deal with them in the first place, but also, of course, by internal fights in the party that after they lost their, their leader after the assassination, they, they were fighting for leadership. No one had the charisma or the intellectual capacity in the flamboyance uh, to mobilize people that Fortuyn had, so that party sort of fell apart. But it made clear that there was a, a huge potential for a party that would be very strict on migration, that would be very anti-EU, that would still be open to uh, 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 the liberal market economy, um, and that would be very open, um, how to say that, to protect individual human rights. Um, because uh, Fortuyn was gay, was a very big proponent of gay rights, minority rights, and that, that produced a very odd combination of um, um, uh, political positions uh, in the Netherlands. That's where Geert Wilders stepped in two years later in that window of opportunity, that political market, uh, when he was kicked out of his original party, the VVD, for being uh, too extremist towards migration. Um, his party took over, so to speak, the, the legacy of the Fortuyn movement, became the second largest party in the country, and entered the government in a peculiar way in 2010. They did not deliver ministers to the government, they just delivered parliamentary support, but on the basis of a very strict and detailed policy program, very anti-migration, anti-development aid, uh, anti-EU, uh, and in favor of animal rights, an important issue for uh, the Party of Freedom, um, that uh, ensured uh, that the government, with the Christian Democrats and the Liberals, uh, would actually move towards the position of the Populist Party. But in doing so, we call that a condoning construction, like he's not participating, but he's condoning the government. Sometimes we have that type of uh, uh, cabinets. Um, his partners were always very reluctant to, to have this party in government, where many even though they're really laughing here at the, big, at the, at the kickoff party of the, of, the, of the government. There were many uh, confrontations, particularly because the Christian Democrats had almost been split over the decision whether or not to participate in this government. About half, almost half, of the party members did not want a coalition with this party, and the Christian Democrats were looking for an opportunity to, to end this coalition as soon as possible because they feared that it would... Um, uh, basically end their party at the next election, which it sort of did, actually. Which some people say, well, that is a good thing, uh, that the Christian Democrats got punished in that way. But others, of course, are less uh, happy about that. The way they did it, again, is, that's the Dutch language, that people are showing lack of responsibility. No one says, like, you're doing a bad thing, or uh, I'm going to kick you out, or whatever. No, it's, it's all about very nice words about responsibility, assuming responsibility or not. Importantly, um, I say here the Wilders Party is a one-man band. In, in understanding, I think, the, well, maybe across Europe, I don't know, but the success of parties, of populist parties, it was, uh, Wilders, looking at the, uh, the internal fights of his predecessor and the end of that party, Learn from that, and he said, well, I'm going to be the boss of my party. I'm not going to allow any members. It's just the one member, and if people can donate, and they can vote, and whatever. But he is really running that party on his own, selecting candidates, uh, designing the, uh, the communication strategies, et cetera, et cetera. Which is a very strenuous thing to do, particularly for a man who is uh, leading, living his life basically undercover. Um, but that's what he chose to do. Whereas other parties, particularly the new one coming up now, the Forum for Democracy, are slowly but very uh, uh, um, persistently trying to build a, a traditional party with members 
with um, mm, uh, an, an, an institutionalized uh, framework for maybe producing a longer lasting effect uh, than builders will have uh, on, on, on Dutch politics. Okay, what about the Netherlands then now? And um, uh, Do I have to run, uh, sort of round up already? Yeah, I, I think. Yeah. Okay, this is our situation now. So we have 13 parties in parliament. It's amazing. Um, and this is, these are the polls uh, mid-February because we are, going at, for an, we are going for an election just like Spain. Eh? Uh, we're having um, provincial regional elections and usually they are not so important but they are important because in the archaic Dutch political system we elect our senate not directly but through the provincial parliaments. Um, so everyone knows that winning or losing the provincial elections will have an effect on having a majority in the Senate or not. And all predictions now are this, that the co current coalition of liberals, Christian Democrats, D66 and a fundamentalist Protestant party, it's a very odd combination, um, is going, which has a two seats majority in the lower chamber, is probably losing its majority of seven, I think it has now, in the Senate. And although the Dutch Senate does not have as much power as the lower chamber, it is nowadays understood that if the opposition uh, uh, really wants to, it can block any um, uh, legislation uh, that, that the government might propose. Some of it temporarily, some of it permanent. It depends on the, uh, the system, uh, uh, on, 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 on the rules that are being applied. So some people are really expecting a major shakeup of Dutch politics, particularly because of this man. This is the, the, new, the new kid on the block, the Forum for Democracy, which only has now 3% uh, of the vote in the lower chamber but is expecting to move up to 9, 10, maybe even more percent of the vote in the provincial elections, thus giving it um, uh, a big chunk in the Senate. And combined with that, the traditional parties are still uh, uh, not, have, not gaining enough votes um, to, to basically impose their ideas uh, on Dutch Parliament. And that is maybe a thing to realize, that if, you, if we, for, for argument's sake, were to combine the uh, all the populist parties in the Netherlands, including the left-wing ones, so there would be the Socialist Party, the Forum for Democracy, and the Party for Freedom, we end up with about 33% uh, of Dutch people at this moment considering to vote for a populist party. And that sort of gives you an idea of another um, contested issue or myth that is mentioned on the paper you have. That is that populism is a temporary phenomenon. That is very unlikely. In, if, we see one, if we observe one thing over the past 20 years, that is that consistently populist parties have scored between 5 and 10% of the vote in most, not all, European countries, and that in some countries there is even a bigger potential for this type of parties. In the Netherlands, it's certainly between 20 and 30%. And that is not going away, and that effectively complicates um, the position of the mainstream parties even further, and is likely to lead to further uh, fragmentation and instability in the Dutch system, I would say. The second thing that has changed, I would say, in the Netherlands over the past 10 years is the intellectual and media landscape. Um, there has been much more polarization uh, about politics, about societal issues than there ever has been in the past, which is partly related to new type of media, like the one who campaigned against the Ukraine uh, treaty, uh, who in the way of how they operate, this is a story about a, a minister who got kicked out for no reason, just because she could not answer a question posed by these people, a very rude question, actually. But it's not only on that, let's say, um, populist track, if you want, um, um, that the change comes. It's also 
intellectuals who have changed in the Netherlands. This is a combination of right-wing intellectuals who have been arguing from universities, from think tanks, about uh, particularly issues that have been taken on by populists as their, as their main issues. And I'm particularly talking about the way they talk about migration and integration and the way they have been talking about uh, how the Netherlands should uh, position itself towards European integration. And they have been feeding into populist argument too. And in that sense, um, I would say that this general discourse, and I'm maybe back to that one approach to populism to see it, that defines it as a, a discourse and no more, but the Dutch general discourse on politics and society has become much more populist, um, roughly speaking, than it ever has been. And in that sense, it's strange that in the 1990s, there was a man, a radical right-wing politician called Jan Maat, who said all types of what we then said terrible things, like uh, the Netherlands is full, no one can enter it anymore. And he was almost kicked out, literally out of a window, uh, at a meeting of his party uh, by protesters, mid 90 because that, but that is actually now a very accepted saying by mainstream parties anyway, just to give you an idea of how uh, discourse in the Netherlands has changed. So in that sense, I foresee, well, a lot of work for political scientists and uh, philosophers like you have to talk about the ethics of democracy, um, but uh, certainly a turbulent period. Now, if you're really interested, I can, uh, but we can do that later. If you want to, I have some more proof of that, the center periphery, uh, Axis is one of the instigators of Dutch populism, but we can only do that if that interests you. So I hope to have made clear that um, populism is a contested concept, that it's very difficult to, I would say, to reach agreement on various important issues surrounding the concept, and that is important because it hinders us in, in, in defining what it is that we really want to investigate, and I would be very interested in in your views both on a, in a general way but also on how you look upon Spanish politics of which I know nothing uh, on how these questions would be applicable yes or no to describing analyzing the Spanish uh, situation and I would be particularly interested in knowing like like what is the what is the main research question that would drive you in in investigating Spanish politics uh, nowadays related to populism so what it is it that that the populist literature and concept will help us in, in studying our, our respective countries nowadays. Um, and of course, I also hope that you have a better idea now of politics in the Netherlands. Thank you so much. Gracias, eh, Berjan, por la inter interesante charla. Eh, hemos aprendido mucho el contexto holandés. Eh, abrimos un momento para la deliberación y preguntar y comentar cuestiones. Eh, respecto a lo que lo que hemos visto, no sé si Salva a seguir seguro que, que, que le interesa temas de populismo tendrá alguna pregunta de estas duras que siempre hace eh, igual que, que Domingo que es un concepto que cuestiona mucho eh, lo abrimos al, al diálogo a lo que queráis And the anti and anti EU is partly related to the anti migration argument, one might argue. Um, but I think that 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 
that doesn't capture the, the entire uh, specter of populist parties. So that would almost imply that we are particularly studying what we in the past probably would call radical right-wing parties, which is fine too if we use that label or so, but I, I'm not sure whether that is the populist thing. Um, I would agree that the pensioner party, yeah, they are single issue party. I'm, the party of, for the animals is, is actually a very comprehensive ideological <laughs> framework which starts from um, uh, the position of, of nature and animals in it. And from that, it deduces actually a very consistent platform of uh, how to deal with society in general. So it's, it's, it's more than fighting for the rights of animals. And it, it, it's very, I wouldn't call it. I would not call the party for the animals a, a single issue party, though. But, but you're right about the pension other parties. Yeah. I'm not sure what I answered your question, though. I mean, you're looking for uh, for, for is there a single issue that might might yeah. capture all populist parties, Some right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry, I thought you were going to answer for me. Okay, so that's a pity. Um, I think I would approach it in a different way. I, I think if there is a common element, it's disgruntledness, relative deprivation. I don't know what you would call it. Groups of people who, either by looking at their position in the past or what they expect to be in the future, relating to whatever they see happening around them, and that could be migrants, but it could also be um, um, uh, CEOs uh, taking a lot of money, but at the same time punishing their, uh, reducing the, the wages of the workers or so. I think this gruntledness might be the common theme, but it will still play out in different issues, so to speak. Um, so, so, so maybe, yeah, so I, I think I would not take the avenue of the, of the single issue, probably. But I may be wrong. I don't know. I must be wrong. <laughs> would it work in Spain, for instance? Oh, sorry. If, 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 would that work for Spain if you... I don't know. I mean, I, I would certainly agree that that most parties, but also populist parties, would try to find, for political strategic reasons, let's say the best issue to 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 campaign on. And and if I look, if I think of the Netherlands, I mean, Wilders, in his in his Freedom Party, in one campaign trying to switch actually away from migration and more to enter EU, and they were much less successful in focusing on, on that theme, and then in the later election they moved back to focusing on, uh, on migration. So in, in that sense, I think it, it, it helps, but uh, I would still assume, but I may be wrong, uh, that, that if you select a, an issue for your political strategy, that the appeal still is that people can connect it also to the other issues in their life that they feel bad about, so to speak, so that so that the uh, the source of, of support for populism is in, is still wider than than that issue itself. But I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not in Spain. I don't, I don't, yeah. well, my question is: seems that 
en Espeina, en fin, en la opinión pública. We have a, a strong relation between inequality and populism. I don't know, that's the mm -hmm. question. Uh, you know, the, the same in, in Europe, but here um, people don't, don't trust in the democracy because this democracy now no, is, is the same of the, no, of the graph. Mm -hmm. Is the same age? Yeah. Y yeah. Yes, but I think the Netherlands, I, I don't know the figures, I expect that the discrepancies in equality are less uh, acute in my country than in Spain, I would accept, but I would, I would still agree that people, um, when they take, let's say, the immediate surroundings as a point of reference, would feel that there is a big, there is a big sense of inequality indeed, because others obtain so much more from, the, from their sin than they themselves. Um, yet the puzzle is then still, I, let's say, I would say, in a standard fashion, I would expect these people to vote for a left-wing party or at best for a left-wing left populist party. But that's, at least in my country, not what I observe. I observe that they actually move to this, this right, well, they're a bit mixed, but the right-wing Freedom Party, or even to the uh, this new maverick, this Freedom for uh, sorry Forum for Democracy Party. So, that, and that is still what puzzles me. That that might be because, to the extent that we talk about traditional voters, I mean, I mean my generation voters, <laughs> that that the um, the party that they used to vote for, Social Democrat, maybe Christian Democrat. Mm, they have no clear story, no answer to their situation. And I assume that for a new generation, looking at you, that, that, the, that the, the traditional parties have no, no, no story to tell either. Um, but that, does it, I do not understand then if it's the young people also who, who feel in a, are at the bad side of inequality that they would vote for a populist party than rather than a left-wing party. I, I still find that personally. I don't have the answer to that. But there is a, a, an interesting question what uh, Salva was saying now as well. Because the, the big research question is what is the element that unifies many different people in, in a populist party? Since they have a thin mm. definition of ideology, no, what is the common element to make people in a transverse uh, of with transversal mm -hmm. ide yes, ideologies to, to join a party or to vote for that party. So it would be sense of inequality, which could mean many maybe, things, maybe. but it would unite people. <laughs> exactly, that is... That, would, that could be the issue then, yeah, that you... But there, is, yeah. there are a lot of differences then between South Europe in that aspect, maybe in the Netherlands. Yeah, that, well, I, I, when we talk about Southern Europe, I can only claim to know a, a little bit in detail Italy, I would say. You can tell me about Spain and other countries, but what I found puzzling there was that it, populism started out as the uh, the mobilization of the people who were doing economically well, but felt hindered by the government in in, in very many ways. It's like the the small family enterprises in the north northeast of Italy, where that's the stronghold, was the stronghold of the Lega. The success of the Lega is. The, that they managed to, to expand it to the to entire Italy. Maybe that was on, on the idea of increased inequality in that country. That that, that could well be. The, the people, though, I think in Italy that always were left out, and that is the young generations who had a hard time in find, still have a very hard time in finding jobs, who postponed uh, moving out of house uh, until, I don't know, when they're in their 30s and so forth, keep on studying, et cetera, et cetera, who, who have no real, well, no real prospect of an independent, successful life very much. And that generation has been growing and growing. That is a generation that votes for, for the Five Star Movement, I would say. They, they feel that, that, that that is an alternative, yeah. So I guess they would be moved by, by inequality, yeah, I would say. Yeah.
Graag gedaan. It gets a hard, isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty hard, especially uh, where I come from, Latin America and Venezuela. Mm. And my question goes precisely because of that. Have you considered to include other ideas in an attempt to, to define more precisely the concept of populism? Because I understand the definition that you have given to us, I, I understand the context. But in Latin America, in Venezuela, the idea of populism is totally different. I mean, yes, the, the, it has a common basis against elite, elite and mainstream political parties, but also includes the idea, for example, of lying consciously, regardless leftists or rightists, political parties, or exacerbation of promises, for example. That, that's my question. Have you considered to include other notions to define this pretty hard to define concept? Um, that's a tough question, if only because I know so little about Latin American politics uh, to my uh, disgrace. Okay, let, let me first make an attempt that there might be something positive in Latin American populism. I mean, but, but you have to correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. I mean, I understood that, particularly in Bolivia and Ecuador, the populism was based on enfranchising, if you want, uh, the uh, indigenous population or people descending from the indig indigenous the population. It could a little less, maybe. Okay, but, but so, to the extent that that has been, let's say, a an effect of bringing people into political representation that previously were not represented. Maybe, I don't know, you, you have to fill out the other cases. Uh, that might have been the case even in Latin American populism for some periods. I'm not saying that it would be for all the time. Um, the other issue that, that, you, that you raise is more, is more complicated. It's, it's, it, I think it's related to the fact that, that Latin American political systems are less party-based, I think, and more based around personalities that more than the cases I've been talking about here in which are all European cases with where political parties in in in, in a institutionalized system with political parties I think maybe a very different uh, context and where the say most Latin American systems I think are presidential systems in which reinforces this idea of the role of the leader, of course, and the and to an extent reduces the role of the political party. So, if, if that is a a relevant um, uh, categorization, how then to judge populism? There? And, and then you're pointing that that for Latin America, it might it might be more about um, leadership in that leadership sense and style, security. clientelism. Yeah. Um, but then I would say, yeah, I do not know the answer to this, but would it make, would you consider so-called so Latin American populists to be acting differently from Latin American non-populists? Or would all, all the, 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 let's say the characteristics that you uh, just put forward also apply to the non-populist Latin American politicians? Or would you say, no, they're all doing this and therefore they're all populist, but it's a different type of populism. It is, okay. if you want, Latin American type, style, style of populism. populism. I mean, the populism has a the common base. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a discourse against elite and mainstream political parties. But in Latin America and Venezuela, my experience is that I have seen that the aim, the purpose is to guarantee votes. Mm -hmm. And if you have to say whatever you need to say, lies, exacerbation of promises, that's good. Whether you are from righties or leftists political party, I have interviewed a lot of political leaders and they know that they are lying. But then they assume like, this is what we have to do because our purpose is to get the votes. So then you, 
if you remember the slide on types of populism, you would be closer to populism in Latin America is like opportunism, just getting out the vote for yourself. Period. No matter if you refer no matter your ideological stance. To, to votes, yes. Yes. Mm. yes. So you would propose then that whenever we study populism, we should then at least separate the European and the Latin American cases as se separate yes. types of yes. populism? Yes, maybe you're... Uh, yes, yes, I, I think it would be more accurate mm -hmm. because I, I agree on the lead on mainstream political parties, but the experience in Latin America, well, the, the purpose is the votes. Mm. The votes. Just seeing that it wasn't included in, in, the, in the presentation, it's not that I disagree with what you have said that, uh, to us, but I said like, wow, I have lived maybe other kind of populism. Maybe other the strategy. I don't want to say that there is a different of populism. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Well, well, to um, actually we send we send it out we send it out to a journal a different version and the comment was indeed that we should be much more clear that it's mainly about european populism rather than for instance latin american so you're right on the mark there um i just wonder i mean is it related to uh is it related to um if it's a presidential system in which the winner of the election presumably will have a lot of authority and power exactly to accomplish the clientelism and so forth to 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 keep the promises he made, so to speak, to to the voters. Would you say that that is almost unlikely to happen in a European context, because there are more, let's say, that the vote usually does not automatically lead to a powerful position, or at the very least that you have to share it with either people in your own party or people in in the coalition government. You will be follow, uh, you will be. Um, uh, um, um, building. So, my question would be: Would you expect ever Latin American type of populism to happen in in Europe, or the other way around? Would you could you envisage that Latin American politics would develop in such a way that it might move more to the European type? Oh, sorry. Um, do you ever think that uh, Latin American type of populism is possible in the Netherlands? In the Netherlands? In in Europe? Sorry. I wouldn't dare to, to give an answer to that because it's the first time I'm living in, 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 in Europe. Uh, I mean, I have traveled some other times, but I have seen some similarities in the case of, of Spain because of the popul uh, polarization mm -hmm. and the constant fight and in the level of discourse and, and, and speech. That In that case, I can tell some things because I come from, from Venezuela. I know what it is about. But in the other countries, I wouldn't dare to, to answer to the question. Bueno, si os parece, gracias. Bueno, lo dejamos aquí. Gracias por las preguntas y por la asistencia. Y, profesor, eh, gracias por venir y por esta interesante charla. Eh, we will keep discussing now in lunchtime. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. And, uh, Hope to see you in some other point.